Hello and welcome to the Actual Magicians. Yes, I am an Actual Magicians bookshelf where in this series we're taking a deep dive into the Shakespearean references within the Waitsmith Tarot, published in 1909. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the Nine of Pentacles and asking the question, why is there a snail illustrated on the card? I hope to tell you exactly what that means from our original research into the deck, which you can find in our book, Secrets of the Waitsmith Tarot, which I wrote with co-author and researcher Tali Goodwin, and that's published by Llewellyn in 2015. I'd also refer to you to the first video in this series, episode one on the Nine of Swords, where I generally share the background of this research and why it gives us a new perspective on the tarot cards and deepens our interpretation when reading them for ourselves or others. So in the Nine of Pentacles, let's take a look first at what Waite says about this card in the accompanying book, The Pictorial Key to the Tarot, first published with the deck as simply the key to the tarot because it didn't have the illustrations of the cards in the original boxed set. So Waite says that this shows a woman with a bird upon her wrist stands amidst a great abundance of grapevines in the garden of a manorial house. It is a wide domain, suggesting plenty in all things. Possibly it is her own possession and testifies to material well-being. And that material well-being that he's tacked on to the end of that paragraph shows us that it's an indicative that he's taken that from the Golden Dawn, which I'll come on to in a second. He either tagged it into the first bit of the sentence or the last bit, but didn't actually cite his source for that particular interpretation, but it's from the Golden Dawn. In terms of divinatory meanings, he says that this is a card of prudence, safety, success, accomplishment, certitude and discernment. And reversed, he gives meanings that it could involve roguery, deception, avoided project or bad faith. So the opposite of the success, accomplishment, certitude and discernment of its right meaning. In the back of the book, he actually gives an additional meaning, which is a prompt fulfilment of what is presaged by neighbouring cards. He's giving a sort of more cartomantic version of it, saying that it means that your fulfilment of whatever you have indicated with the other cards is going to be quite quick when the Nine of Pentacles turns up. But reversed, the standard cartomantic meaning is just vain hopes that you're hoping for something that will never actually succeed or give you any gain. He was taking this idea of material well-being directly from the Golden Dawn Book T. Again, if you refer back to the first video in this series, I've given more importance and information on how the Golden Dawn Book T feeds into the Waitsmith Tarot. In effect, the Waitsmith Tarot is more of a Golden Dawn deck than we might first assume. So here's what is said in Book T. First of all, the card is called Material Gain. And Alistair Crowley, also taking from the Golden Dawn in his Thoth Tarot, calls this card simply Gain. And we can see that Waite has just revised that title of Material Gain to Material Well-Being. But either way, both Crowley and Waite are carrying forward the Golden Dawn idea of it being Gain, Material Gain. So, as well as calling it material gain, Book T in the Golden Dawn says this of the card. It is the complete realisation of material gain, goods, riches, inheritance, covetousness, treasuring of goods, and sometimes theft and knavery. And again, we can see that weight in his reversed meanings had this idea of roguery in terms of knavery or just a bad actor, as we would call them these days. The whole according to dignity, which is what was often said in a lot of the cards in the Golden Dawn. And again, it goes back to what Wade is saying, what is presaged by neighbouring cards. He means we have to look at the cards around it to get a bit more meaning as to what this card applies to. Now, the Golden Dawn took that meaning from the Yesod of Asiya, the ninth of the Sephiroth on the Tree of Life, because it's card nine, a seer, 
the world of action, the lower world in Kabbalah, in the four worlds, which corresponds to the pentacles. So they're seeing this as the foundation of the world of action, and therefore its inheritance and much increase of goods. It's like the creative, reproductive foundation of the entirety of manifestation in Kabbalistic terms is the Yisod of Asiya. It's the ground from which everything comes forth and increases. That's what its basic job is in terms of the Sephiroth in that world. Now, it's partly this idea of inheritance because we assume that Pamela Common Smith had book T as her working document, and we've seen that in several of the other cards. We can almost demonstrate that she got it from book T and nowhere else. But it's the idea of inheritance that seems to have inspired her to draw on a very specific part of Shakespeare for this card. It's interesting that there are three of the nines in the Waitsmith Tarot that are uniquely and very directly connected to Shakespearean characters and plays. And we have the photographs, as the kids say these days, we have the receipts to back this up. We have photographs of actresses at the time, which we'll come on to shortly, playing these characters or actors playing these characters that are seen in the cards as well. And so Pamela drew on this specific character perhaps using Waits' notes on success, accomplishment, certitude and discernment, the most discerning, successful, accomplished, prudent person in all of Shakespeare's plays is the character of Rosalind, the protagonist of the play, as you like it. So this card is Rosalind, and we can see in different actresses, at the time that we have a sense of who Rosalind is and who Rosalind is in the play. She is a very independent person. She transgresses. She works across any of the so-called barriers that might be in front of her, her gender, her age, her station in life, her family, her relationships, and so forth to basically organise things and work with them to get what it is that not only she wants, but is successful for the people around her. She does this through a certain amount of conniving and a certain amount of manipulation, but nonetheless she does it in order that everyone succeeds, that everyone gets the best out of their situation. And for a lot of the plays, she is dressed as a shepherd, as a character, she goes by the name of Ganymede, but at one point she is fooling her suitor, Orlando, to play to her as if she is Rosalind. And it's uh, one of these Shakespearean complexities, and we have to go with the idea that no one recognises her. In fact, there's a nod at the end of the play, where two of the characters say to each other, the shepherd figure seemed to have a, a reminder of my daughter or a reminder of Rosalind. And it's sort of played for laughs, basically, that no one recognises her just because she has pulled up her hair and has dressed as a man. In this rather stylized image, we see a scene from towards the start of the play after a wrestling match, and we can see one of the characters being carried off in the back there. And Rosalind is giving Orlando a token of affection. And she is accompanied by her cousin Celia, who is often seen with Rosalind throughout the whole play. And at one point, they're accompanied by a fool character. And interestingly enough, Rosalind also talks about knowing a magician. And she also has a little speech about the Wheel of Fortune and the fact that fortune and the wheel doesn't necessarily favour women in their society. And so there's a couple of, in fact, there's three tarot card references there to the magician, the fool and the wheel of fortune. They're literally mentioned as the fool, the magician and the wheel of fortune within the play itself. But most of the images of Rosalind throughout the play tend to be of her dressed as Ganymede, as the shepherd character, as the male character. 
And of course, this would be played for double laughs in the fact that in Shakespeare's time, all of the actors would be male, so they would be a man playing a woman playing a man and so forth, which again could be played for laughs on the stage. Now, interestingly enough, most of the staging and costuming of this character often has her carrying a spear, and I did wonder about that because obviously we don't see a spear, and we certainly don't see her dressed as a shepherd in the card. We see her in her full Rosalind dress and headdress, and so... Perhaps the spear and the shepherd form of Rosalind really doesn't fit the image of the card. But the reason that Rosalind fits so well is because of her independence and her ability to get gain for everybody. Not just material gain, but gain in relationships, gain in status, gain in all sorts of things within the play itself. So the staging of her with a spear is actually from a description she gives her herself when she and Celia have decided to go and try and find Celia's uncle, Rosalind's father, who is in the forest of Arden, which is where a lot of the play also takes place in the forest. And Rosalind says, why, whither shall we go? Celia says, to seat my uncle in the forest of Arden. Rosalind replies, alas, what danger will it be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, says Celia, and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like do you, so we shall pass along and never stir assailants. And Rosalind, always the loquacious creator of good ideas, returns, We're not better, because I am more than common tall, that I did suit me at all points like a man. A gallant kirtle axe upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart lie there what hidden woman's fear there will. We'll have a swashing and a martial outside, as many other mannish cowards have that do outface it with their semblances. And Celia says, What shall I call thee when thou art a man? Rosalind replies, I'll have no worse a name than Jove's own page, and therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. So, Rosalind takes on the nature of Ganymede the shepherd, but she does so with a boar spear to ward the boars off from attacking the flock. And she's quite often seen in the late Victorian images that we have of actresses playing her with both a sword and a spear. Now, my guess, and this is only a guess, is that Pamela Common Smith didn't have a spear as a symbol within the card because this would have confused the card with any of the other swords card. So my belief is that she changed this for the hunting bird in order to carry the same meaning, that there was a sort of hunting theme to the character. Now, how do we know that this is Rosalind other than the fact that we have an idea that Pamela took the concepts of the Golden Dawn Book Tea and applied them to the cards through the lens of plays and Shakespearean characters that she was very familiar with? Well, one of the main reasons is that little snail. Because once we see the snail and then find it, we find it in Shakespeare in several different places, but more notably in As You Like It, and it's in a short monologue by Rosalind herself. And so not only do we have the dress that is also decorated with rose symbols in order to indicate it's Rosalind, we also have this quote as well, and it explains why the snail is there and how it fits into the card. So this card is all about gain and is about material gain and certitude and having everything that you desire. And the snail appears in Act 4, Scene 1. On. And Orlando is still acting to Rosalind as Ganymede, but pretending she is Rosalind so that she can find out what Orlando really thinks of Rosalind. And she is tricking Orlando to practice, in effect, his wooing of Rosalind through Ganymede the Shepherd. If that makes sense, it's a typical Shakespearean double-double-double thing. And in this scene, Orlando has come to Rosalind, is towards the final 
part of the play, Act 4, Scene 1. It's about 1,800 lines into the play, so it's buried a little bit. But it's just before she reveals herself and puts everything aright and sets all of the relationships up as she's been setting them up throughout the entire play. And Orlando says to her as Ganymede, but pretending she is Rosalind, My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. And Rosalind says... Break an hour's promise in love, he that will divide a minute into a thousand parts, and break but a part of the thousand parts of a minute in the affairs of love, it may be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him on shoulder, and I'll warrant him heart whole. Orlando says, pardon me, dear Rosalind. Rosalind replies, nay, and you be so tardy, come no more in my sight. She's really putting it on, laying it thick here. In fact, I think the laying it on with a trowel quote comes from this actual play. I had as lief be wooed as a snail. Of a snail, says Orlando. Rosalind replies, I of a snail. For though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns, which such as you are fain to be beholding to your wives, for he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Orlando replies, Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. Rosalind mutters to herself, and I am your Rosalind. In effect, what Rosalind is saying is that a snail has the idea of independence and material wealth, he is heart whole in a sense in the material realm because he actually has his house on his head, as she puts it. And also the fact that he brings his destiny with him is a bit of a play, a bit of a humorous sexual double entendre with cuckolding and the horns and and so forth, which is probably not relevant, although it is slightly relevant to the idea of Esod as the sexual imagery, the location of the sexual organs on the tree of life, and this idea of foundation and inheritance and so forth. So there's some perhaps sexual symbolism overlaid into that as well. But it's certainly the snail is there to indicate this independence this sense that Rosalind has of her own independence and also of inheritance in terms of she is due to inherit from her father, but there's been a problem, he is left and she's wanting him to return and so forth and she's concerned about her inheritance and also what her relationships do as well to inheritance. And there's a lot of that in the play itself. So we can see that this card is very much about that sense of ownership, of certitude, of being able to support oneself and so forth. And there is a a side to that independence about how that then affects you in relationships if you have joint ownership of things and the impact that it has on your sense of personal wealth and independence within relationships as well because this is a after all it's a nine of pentacles it's in the world of action and material things so there is a sense of that as well. Incidentally, King Lear also mentions a snail where the fool actually asks Lear, canst thou tell how an oyster makes his shell? And Lear says, no. And the fool says, no, I neither. But I can tell why a snail has a house. And Lear replies, why is this? And the fool says, why to put heads in, to not give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. So again, there's that idea of inheritance and ownership, not giving it away to his daughters like his own house and so forth. And all of this is carried by this wonderful character by Rosalind, who is ingenious, is witty, is, as Helen Mirren said, is maybe the only female character that is only not only well-written in Shakespeare or underwritten, but is actually overwritten. So uh, having ascertained that this character is indeed Rosalind in As You Like It, one of the main things we wanted to do was really bring that to life and to demonstrate 
how Pamela was actually drawing on what were called cabinet cards in the sense of these were often collectible portraits of the actors and actresses in the Shakespearean plays, often from the Lyceum Theatre that Henry Irving and Ellen Terry were involved with and Pamela was the stage designer, set designer and general dog's body, I think, for the company. And we know that the cabinet cards were always roughly of the same format. They had a backdrop, they had a staging, they had costume, they also had a prop, a single prop to give a sense of perspective. This was often anything between a fence to some flowers to a wall to a a boat, but a three-dimensional thing that was added to the scene in order to make the image have depth and come to life. And there are lots and lots of cabinet cards that all follow this same format, and it's exactly the same format we see in Pamela Coleman Smith's artwork for the tarot deck. She was, in effect, making a series of cabinet cards, which could be done in a hurry in the same way that nowadays graphic novel artists are often employed for producing tarot cards because they can do a narrated story in images very quickly because to do it in fine art can take years and years and years. For example, the Toth deck took five years to actually create because it was done in a or considered manner, whereas the Waite Smith Terry was done in literally five months' time. And so when we look at these cabinet cards, we can actually find our Rosalind and find her as Ada Rehan, who was an actress shortly before Pamela's time, so Pamela would have had knowledge and history of this actress and in this particular image, we can see Ada Rehan as Rosalind. We can see her both as the shepherdess version or shepherd version as Ganymede. We can see her full length and standing in costume for a stage image. But also we can see her as Rosalind in full dress. And as we saw with the Helen Mirren BBC play, the headdress can vary, but we've still got that sort of black hair tight underneath the hat that she uses to hide her femininity when she is Rosalind as Ganymede. And Ada Rehan was actually known for her black, dark, curly locks. And we can see again when we now take another look at the Nine of Pentacles that we have those black curly locks very clearly in the image and a slightly more stylized version of the sort of headdress that would be worn as we saw certainly with the Helen Mirren BBC play that would be worn at that time for the character in full Cousin of the Duke regalia. So I hope this identification of the Nine of Pentacles as Rosalind gives us another layer. And that's what this research is trying to do, is give us yet another layer to reading the card. The more we know about Rosalind, the more we can read the card as that sense of independence and so forth. But also, we don't have to know anything about this to be able to read the card, which is the genius of Pamela Coleman Smith's design and artwork and also down to the vagary that Arthur Edward Waite was putting into Pictorial Key that has allowed a hundred years to go by before anyone has really needed to look at the actual sources and the likely textual source which is Book Tea of the Golden Dawn and visual sources which are down to Pamela Coleman Smith's theatrical background and identify them in their own time. That was never necessary because we have had a century of interpretation on the cards because of their vague nature. And unlike the Thoth Tarot, where we have five years of correspondence between Alistair Crowley and Lady Frida Harris, and so we know exactly what, what their thinking was, what their design was, what their sources were, and Alistair Crowley wasn't hiding those or trying to keep a secret oath when he came to write the Book of Thoth for his cards. So there was no problem with him having to hide anything as weight was still coming out of the Golden Dawn and trying to not reveal that that was his source for all of the design and the text, even though 10 years later he then took time took a few years to develop his own tarot images, which we cover in Abiding in the Sanctuary, 
which he did with the artist J.B. Trinick as part of his fellowship at the Rosie Cross. And that's another story. But here we can see that Pamela has really taken the design lead and had Ada Rehan playing Rosalind with the snail in the Nine of Pentacles. So again, I hope you found that useful. We have plenty more deep dives to go and I look forward to seeing you in another of the videos. And until then, the worker, as ever, is hidden in the workshop.